In 1849, the news of the discovery of gold brought a flood of humanity across the plains, deserts, and mountains of the American West. By the close of the decade, more than 180,000 people had trekked a half a continent to see California. Gold mining was the main occupation, but there were other avenues of employment then as well. This was a time and a place so desperately in need of entertainment that anyone with just an ounce of talent could make it big. Polly Nogden was announced short. It wasn't easy being one of the first comedians in the Old West. Miners wanted to see beautiful singers and long-legged dancers sashaying across the stage. Imagine their surprise when I would come out fanning myself with body old maid cards, juggling dried buffalo chips and telling jokes and act like mine was some of the only entertainment those lonely 49ers had. And once they stopped throwing things at me, I think they really enjoyed it. Pauline Ogden, 1859. The great rush for gold that saturated California's foothills in 1849 began with a trickle in the springs around Sutter's Mill. News of the discovery swept through the country and the madness for gold triggered a stampede west. The American West of the early 1800s was a land of rumor, known in its parts by a few trappers and explorers, known as a whole by no one. The first gold seekers in California were mostly men. The lack of affordable housing, the hostile environment, the high cost of travel, and the expense of living in a boom town prevented men from bringing their wives and families or sweethearts to join them. Most of the married men who did come planned to strike it rich and return home to enjoy a life of leisure. As such, they had little feeling of permanence or belonging to the community they helped create. It is a paradox that while most of these men wanted quick wealth with which to buy leisure time and to find pleasure, few acquired any. Seeking gold was hard work, but at dusk, the miners would leave their picks where they had last dug and return to their camps with their pans. After a hard day's work panning for gold, most of these miners had one thing on their minds, entertainment. Miners often sought a variety of pleasures during their evening hours, but their options were limited. One miner wrote how little there was to do for fun in the mining camp. There's really nothing to do for fun in the mining camps. We sit around the campfire, laugh at our holy britches and talk, maybe sing a song, play cards. It's so boring. Leonard Kipp, 1849. Fortunately for the miners, the entertainers arrived shortly after they moved in. And the miners with gold fever weren't the only ones who made their strike in the gold country. Stories of gold being tossed at the feet of performers led many singing and dancing acts west. By 1849, 20,000 gold hunters were working or prospecting along Bear River. Because of the miners' insatiable appetite for entertainment, they were willing to pay handsomely to see shows and variety acts. And there was never a shortage of actors. Many accounts and memoirs relate the hardships and privations that faced the entertainers in the 1850s in this rugged country. Besides the threat of poverty, they faced threats from the elements, road agents, Indians, and inhospitable communities. The entertainers came seeking their fortune with the underlying courage, dedication, and faith in their ability to bring pleasure to the pioneers. Most, however, ended their days in hapless surroundings. In spite of the dangers and no promise of fame, actors, singers, and dancers continued to come west. Even the most popular entertainers met with hardships from time to time. Lotta Crabtree, the famous star and her troupe, met with some difficulty from road agents. Jake Wallace, Crabtree's banjo player, wrote about an experience they had in his diary. We met that bandit Black Bart on the road today. When he found out we weren't the male, he let us go. We parted as good friends. Jake Wallace, 1850. The first public amusements and early days of the theater have always fascinated the American populace. From its beginning, entertainment has represented a jumbled array of talented people who were scattered through time like priceless gems. As the need for entertainment grew in the frontier communities, 
Medicine shows took to the road with traveling minstrels. The performers traveled by riverboat, foot, and stagecoach. They had to be strong and dedicated because life was demanding, with makeshift lodgings and seldom a hearty meal. In the 1870s, the variety show appeared. They offered everything from cheap, body fun to acrobats, singers, and comedians with slapstick. The floors of the temporary theaters were covered with sawdust, and the seats were hard. When the audience became excited, they would hiss the villain, applaud the heroine, and cry for the downtrodden. Before the entertainers filled the hills around the gold country, life in the mining camps was very dull. There was very little to do, you see. So miners kept themselves amused with spelling bees and Saturday night shoot 'em ups and bear and thumb wrestling, hunting and fishing expeditions. They'd have dances, and where there wasn't a whole lot of women, miners might dance with each other. Miners playing the female roles would tie handkerchiefs around their arms sometimes to spice things up, some of them would even dress up in women's clothing and wear makeup. Now, some might ask where these rugged miners, what they were doing with women's clothing and makeup. No one really knows, and oddly enough, no one has ever really wanted to find out. Some gold seekers, such as Franklin Langworthy, a Universalist minister, were especially offended by how the miners spent their leisure time. Packs of cards are kept in nearly every house, tent, and cabin, and are generally in use either for amusement or gambling. Checkers and chess are seldom played. These games require the player to exercise some thought and reflection. Mental labor of every kind is altogether avoided and looked upon with contempt by the great mass of California. Franklin Langworthy, 1850. I didn't mind playing cards or gambling as long as I got to dress like those perky saloon gals. Sometimes the miners would be so bored, they just make up games. Uh, for instance, they would just sit around and come up with words that rhymed with peas. Heats, rice, moss, ties, needs, leaks. Um, these were some of the more popular answers, but also to kill the time, they just come up with soup recipes. Um, some of them included sideburns and barley soup, cream of gristle, uh, old-fashioned grease and weasel, and a mink bisque. So with this kind of inane activity, you can see why the miners so desperately needed entertainers. It was at this time that a woman destined to make an impact on the entertainment scene was coming into her own. Her name was Pauline Ogden. Pauline was born in Independence, Missouri. Her parents, Frida and Roger, operated a general store. She was one of nine children and at an early age showed a great talent for making people laugh. She would make the customers in her father's store laugh by shoving licorice strips up her nose and smearing honey all over her face. At first, her parents thought she had some mental disorder. They speculated on whether or not to send her to a hospital. Her outrageous antics brought more and more people into the store, and her parents decided they couldn't afford to part with their crazed little bundle of publicity. The Ogden Mercantile became a very popular place. Pioneers on their way west would load up on supplies there and catch a glimpse of one of the shows Pauline would put on. Some of her acts included balancing ears of corn on her nose, a remarkable impersonation of Bat Masterson and a tribute to the country's independence featuring a patriotic march and humorous limerick readings. At some point, and no one is sure when, Pauline began adding jokes to her show. I guess she was one of the first female stand-up comics, even though most of her jokes were in fact delivered while she was sitting backwards on a mule. Well, she had quite a few memorable witticisms, one joke that she told in particular that was guaranteed to bring down the store was, you can lead a horse to water, but before you push him in, just stop and think how a wet horse smells. <sighs> well, that joke left him rolling in the canned goods aisle. Like many promising entertainers, Pauline longed to appear on the New York stage. She had heard the wonderful stories about the shows that were being performed there, and she wanted to be a part of it. 
On her 17th birthday, she boarded a stage bound for New York. This would be the only stage east of the Mississippi that Pauline would ever be on. Theater owners didn't understand her humor, and they didn't find her attractive enough to agree to put her in the shows. Theater owners suggested Pauline get a whole new wardrobe, hair, a complete makeover. And she used this experience to her advantage and turned it into one of her early comedy routines. One that she would go on to do at Sid Saloon in Utah. In her act, she used to say, mud packs aren't good for the complexion. Did you ever see a pretty pig? Not only did she have trouble getting work, but she had trouble finding a man. But she turned that into a comedy routine too. Uh, one of her jokes about dating was about a little old woman who fell in love with a 90-year-old man until she made a date with him. She goes out with him that night and a friend says the next morning, how'd you like him? She says, I had to slap his face three times. And the friend says, why? Did he get fresh? She said, no, I thought he was dead. Pauline stayed on in New York for a while and continued to try and break into the business. She had a variety of jobs while waiting for the big break that never seemed to come. She played the snare drum in the Lincoln Players Marching Band. She babysat, modeled women's corsets, and organized drinking bees. No matter what she did, she never abandoned her desire to entertain. She found an audience among her co-workers on every job she had. At the height of the gold rush, Pauline decided to go west. She felt that the miners would welcome her humorous acts, and there she could find the success that she always dreamt of. She didn't have the money to get to the gold country, though, so she took out an ad in the Sacramento paper looking for a husband. She came up with a poem that many female pioneers, in hopes of finding a husband, quoted on their way to California. It went something like this. If you're fond of hunting, there's no place that can compare. You may not bag a lion or a tiger or a bear, but if you want a jackass, there are plenty of them out there. Go west, young woman. Pauline's advertisement created quite a stir around the mining camps. The 49ers didn't quite know what to make of it. A husband wanted by a lady who can wash, cook, scour, sew, milk, spin, weave, hoe, cut wood, make fires, feed the pigs, raise chickens, saw a plank, drive nails, and juggle. These are a few of the solid branches. Now for the ornamental. I can find six states on the atlas. Can read and write. Can ride a horse, donkey, or oxen besides a great many things too numerous to be mentioned here. Now for my terms. My age is none of your business. I'm neither handsome nor a fright. Yet an old man need not apply. Pauline Ogden, 1853. Pauline responded to one of the five answers to her advertisement. She thought by his letters he sounded nice enough, and she agreed to marry him. It's slim pickings out there. When you're first single, you're so optimistic. At the beginning, you want a man who is smart, good-looking, solvent. At this time in my life, I'm just looking for a mammal with a day job. Pauline Ogden, 1853. Pauline journeyed o'er the plains in a canvas-covered wagon. Wide wheels kept wagons from sinking into the sand. For settlers with no baggage or little money, the luxury of a prairie schooner was abandoned in favor of carts. Other emigrants walked west with packs on their backs. Some even started the journey pushing wheelbarrows. Pauline used the time at night around the campfire to fetch water for her fellow travelers and hone her craft. She would keep the exhausted pioneers laughing with her jokes about the difficult trip west. She made up jokes about the route they were taking, the long journey, and the people on the wagon train. According to diaries and journals, though, I guess she did a great impersonation of the cook. 
One of her trail jokes went something like this. If you like to spend your vacation in out-of-the-way places where few people go, let your wife read the map. The women didn't find this very funny at all. They agreed then that if they were ever attacked by Indians on their way to the gold country, they would give them Pauline in exchange for their freedom. The minute the wagon train Pauline Ogden was a part of arrived in California, there was trouble. Pauline found little or no humor in what was about to happen. The July afternoon was warm, the sky a cornflower blue, and the foothills tinged with summer green. Pauline's heart was pounding excitedly. How long she had waited for these final moments before she would be a married woman. The wagon train Pauline was a part of was held up five miles from Grass Valley. Four masked men stepped out onto the road. The driver quickly hauled back the reins and slammed the brakes on with his foot. The team skidded and reared. Pauline and the others were ordered out of the train, and they had four, four double-barreled shotguns were pointed right at them. Pauline tried to add a little levity to the situation and relieve the tension. She said, you think crime in California is bad, you ought to go to New York. You can go 10 blocks and never leave the scene of the crime. No one found humor in that remark either. Pauline was scared, but she was curious about these men whose faces were covered by masks. The leader grabbed the strong box, attacking it with a miner's pick. They broke the outer lock, but were stopped from stripping it of its contents by a second padlock. The men blasted that lock open with blasting powder. One of the bandits lost his mask while rifling through the money in the box. Pauline got a good look at the thief. She told one of the people she'd met on the wagon train that, although the masked man was a criminal, she found him to be very handsome. The bandits hurried off, and the wagon train continued on into town. Pauline was a few days away from being married by then. When she arrived at her never-before-seen fiancé's home, then the strange woman was there to meet her at the door. Pauline was disappointed. She thought her fiancé would be there to meet her. Well, the woman turned out to be Pauline's future sister-in-law. She asked Pauline if she'd picked a date for the wedding. Pauline responded with, Wow, you can bring a date to your own wedding? I'm going to like living out west. The big day came two days later. Pauline still had not met her fiancé. She wore the gown her mother wore at her own wedding. She entered the living room of the house where the ceremony was being held and crossed to a clergyman and a witness sitting off to one side of the room. She looked around and caught sight of a tall, strikingly handsome man standing off to one side. His face was partially shaded by a bowl of flowers. The preacher continued to busy himself getting everyone in their rightful positions for the wedding ceremony. Something about her fiancé seemed familiar to Pauline. It wasn't until after the vows were exchanged and Pauline's husband went to kiss the bride that she recognized him as the leader of the gang who held up the wagon train. Pauline raced out of the house and headed toward San Francisco. The marriage was annulled and Pauline added another subject to her long list of comedy material. Pauline turned this heartbreaking experience into a funny one. And riding on the stage to San Francisco, she found she had a captive audience in the other passengers. Her new material was on marriage. Her best joke on the subject was, marrying a man is like buying something you've been admiring for a long time in a shop window. You may love it when you get it home, but it doesn't always go with everything else in the house. She took a big bow as the audience laughed. I doubt they would have thought she was so amusing if they found out she had only been married for three and a half minutes. On May 22, 1853, a San Francisco newspaper advised its readers that the world-renowned Lola Montez, the Countess of Lansfeld, arrived in the city on the Northerner. Miss Montez was going to be performing at the American Theater. By now, Pauline had been in San Francisco for six months. The only work she could find entertaining was guessing people's weight in a parlor show in a saloon off the main street of the city. Pauline had heard that Lola Montez was very talented, 
and was the first in line to see her performance. I was hoping to go backstage and meet up with Montez after the show. I think if she hears a few of my jokes, she'll give me a chance. I thought I'd start out with one of my favorites. I went to the doctor. I said, Doc, my foot. I can't walk. He said, you'll be walking before the day is over. He took my horse. Pauline Ogden, 1853. Lola Montez had become famous for her titillating spider dance. Men were fascinated by her moves. The dance was a serious look at what would happen if a woman got trapped in a huge nest of spiders and had cobwebs entangling her ankles. The audience was speechless. The only sound that could be heard was the laughter coming from Pauline. She thought it was the most hilarious act she had ever seen. She was promptly removed from the theater and tossed out into the street. She could never get back in to meet with Montez after that. She realized then that she had destroyed any chance at being an opening act for Lola. Pauline sunk into a great depression and took up drinking, which oddly enough helped her make it to the next stage in her career. She often came to work drunk and patrons who wanted their weight guests found her to be absolutely hilarious. On several occasions, her boss would chastise her for being drunk on the job. She insisted she wasn't drunk, but that she had been merely overserved. Of course, there were times that she agreed with her employer that she might have had one too many. But she even made that confession amusing. In fact, she was quoted as saying, I have a very good reason for being loaded tonight. I've been drinking all day. She spent a lot of time drowning down new material every night while she tied one on. In fact, the more she drank, the funnier she got. People said it was a joy to watch her work. Most people who frequented the saloon drank too. Although they found her funny, they could never remember what she said or did the next day. Consequently, again, her career went nowhere. My uncle staggered in the other night loaded. His wife said, where have you been? He said, I bought something for the house. She said, what did you buy for the house? He said, a round of drinks. Pauline Ogden, 1853. Pauline was hearing rumors about a little girl named Lotta Crabtree who was traveling from mining camp to mining camp entertaining 49ers. The friendly miners who gathered to watch the child star tossed bags of gold at her feet. Pauline decided to take her act on the road in much the same way Lotta Crabtree was doing. She began her tour right where the gold rush started, Sutter's Mill. There's been dancers that came through here, singers, magic acts, two guys selling something called Ginsu knives, but we'd never seen anything like this. A woman who wore men's clothing, told jokes, danced on a stump, and made hilarious sounds using her under armpit. Sid Friedman, 1856. Pauline's act consisted of what we know today to be a monologue and a few skits one of which featured an actor dressed in a bear costume who would wrestle with Pauline for a little while and then at the end of the match the two would do a dance together. They were quite good. At one point though, the actor, while still in costume one night after the show, he was mauled by a real bear. Evidently it was mating season and the actor was completely caught off guard. Pauline eliminated the skit from the show. What else could she do? The bear costume was ruined. Miss Ogden continued to travel through the foothills performing. She was making quite a name for herself. Some critics argue that it wasn't hard to do, considering there wasn't much of a variety of entertainment in mining camps. The acts were very limited. You had the two pants, Mahoney show, all he did was walk around wearing two pairs of pants. You had the Hank Beesman show. 
he would release wasps onto the mining crowd and the audiences could win valuable prizes if they caught them. There was Stump Johnson's world of angry beavers, lot of crab tree, and of course, Pauline Ogden's comedy review. Pauline didn't care much for lot of crab tree, but she did have a great deal of respect for the animal acts that traveled the mining camps. All creatures must learn to coexist. That's why the brown bear and the field mouse can share their lives and live in harmony. Of course, they can't mate, or the mice would explode. <coughs> Pauline Ogden, 1858. After traveling around for months, Pauline was finally given an engagement in a bit theater called The Elite, a shabby place on the San Francisco waterfront surrounded by cheap businesses. Pauline was thrilled and believed that she was finally on her way. Little did she know what was in store for her when she returned to San Francisco. Evidently, there was a double booking at the Elite the night Pauline was to open. Eva Tangway, the I Don't Care Girl, was also opening. Now, Eva had virtually no talent, but she did have large breasts and wore scanty outfits created from dollar bills with Lincoln pennies for spangles. Her costumes always packed the theaters wherever she played. She was the first to do what we know today as a lap dance. She would dance while singing a tune that she made very popular called Get Your Biscuits in the Oven and Your Buns in the Bed. This is the hand God dealt me and I'm going to play it. I'll share the stage with Miss Tangway and do my best but I don't have to like it. Those men will grow tired of her act and that's when I'll go out and bring the house down. Who am I kidding? Dressed like Ava is, she's the most powerful magnet in the universe and all men in the audience are cheap metal. Pauline Ogden, 1860. Pauline did go on and she was funny. She got a lot of laughs when she sang a humorous tune entitled, I wouldn't take her to a dogfight because I'm afraid she'd win. Halfway through her act, the men in the audience began chanting Eva's name and demanded she return to the stage. Eva quieted the cheering crowd down when she gyrated out wearing only a thin layer of veils. Pauline could only watch. She knew she had lost the audience at that point and there was no way she could get them back. She started yelling insults at Miss Tangway. I couldn't take it after a while. I had to do something. I shouted, If you ever become a mother, can I have one of your puppies? She broke down and cried, ran off stage, leaving a trail of half dollars behind her. Pauline Ogden, 1860. The reviews of the show in the San Francisco paper the following day were less than glowing. The funniest thing about Pauline Ogden's show was the song and dance stylings of Eva Tangway. San Francisco, Alta Newspaper. I've never seen anything like it, and I hope I never do again. San Francisco, City Times. That's an hour and a half of my life I'll never get back. California Daily News. The Elite Theater closed Pauline's show the next day and changed Eva's playbill to read the Tangway Review, the funniest, most tantalizing show west of the Mississippi. Eva would play the elite for 13 weeks. After that, she agreed to grow a mustache and tour with actress Sophie Tucker, playing the part of the gardener in the little-known Shakespearean play, Princess Twinklebeam and the Tooth Fairy. Pauline again sunk into a deep depression. She left San Francisco and made her way to Virginia City where she hooked up with the owner of a Wild West dog and monkey rodeo. He thought she would make a great master of ceremonies for the show, but it was a struggle for her to write new material for yet another show. She spent a great deal of time in the saloon. And just when she thought she couldn't get any lower, she met up with Samuel Clements, or Mark Twain as he would be later known as. Pauline Ogden and Mark Twain had a brief love affair. He took her mind off of her problems for a while, but in the end, 
she grew restless. What she wanted was a solvent career in comedy, not a boyfriend. Pauline was a beautiful woman, comparatively speaking, of course. Most women that far out west were not handsome to say the least. I had to take Dramamine just to keep eye contact with most of them. Pauline was different. She made me laugh. She always said, relationships, give us a good reason to live, revenge. She broke things off with me after a few months. I learned a lot from her. I learned that women aren't really turned on by animal noises and seductive tongue gestures. That information came in handy later on in my life. Pauline stayed with the Wild West Dog and Monkey Rodeo for six months. They toured some of the toughest towns around. While in Bodie performing, one of the monkeys accidentally shot her. It was then that she toyed with the idea of going back to Missouri. That stupid monkey. My leg is killing me. Why didn't he stick to riding that little unicycle and leave the gunplay for the dogs? Maybe it's time I pack it in and head back the way I came. I've got to do something. I'm out of work again. The trouble with unemployment is that the minute you wake up in the morning, you're on the job. Pauline Ogden, 1862. Pauline had to wait until her leg healed before she could go anywhere. She stayed in a small room at one of the saloons in town. She wallowed in her own self-pity for several weeks. Then suddenly she decided she wasn't going to take it anymore. She talked the saloon owner into letting her turn a portion of the business over to her to use as a stage for a variety show. He agreed, and Pauline began putting on some of her original comedy plays. Pauline staged a variety of clever work. There was Beef Stew and You, the gambler who counted cards, Nugget, and the horse with problem flatulence. They were all very well received. In 1865, she invited President Lincoln to travel out west and see one of her shows. He declined, choosing instead to attend a performance of Country Cousin at Ford's Theater. Pauline told the Bodie newspaper that the assassination of Lincoln could never have happened at her place. The death of Lincoln had an adverse effect on the theater. When the audience seemed to stop coming to Pauline's shows, she decided to offer herself as a repentant sinner appearing in a series of religious lectures. One night after she had finished speaking at a rally at the Bodie Church and Shooting Gallery, she was shot in the chest as she was leaving the building. Oddly enough, it was a monkey that killed her. That same monkey that she used to work for. Somehow he got hold of another weapon and he shot her. I don't think, though, he meant to do it. His owner said that he was only cleaning the gun. But that was the end of Pauline Ogden. The obituary page in the Bodie's Daily Free Press announced Pauline's death the next day. They called her an amusing woman with a quick wit, someone who even knew how to die funny. News of her unusual and comical demise spread throughout the country. At least she'd achieved the big laugh she had always hoped for. I never want to die, but if I do, I hope it turns out to be a great career move. Pauline Ogden, 1853. was a comedian from the wild wild west her name was pauline and she could have been the best she played a lot of skits she was in a lot of shows but she should have stayed away from the monkey rodeo Zuh.